Welcome to Autism Knows No Borders. Discover what's possible when people impacted by autism inspire change and build community. Together with the Global Autism Project, here's your host, Rachel Harmon. Hello, everyone. Today's guest is Yasser Al Jaidi. Yasser is the co founder and clinical director of Namai Center in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. The staff at Namai provide behavioral therapy services to early learners in their community. The Global Autism Project partnered with Namai in 2018, and we have since sent two Skill Corps volunteer teams to provide sustainable hands on training. In today's conversation, Yasser explains how autism is understood in Saudi Arabia and what services are available to families from diagnosis to adulthood. As the first registered behavior technician to become certified in his country, Yasser shares how he began working with the autistic population and why he created the Give Me a Voice program to target communication skills. He describes the challenges he has faced over the years and offers advice to other practitioners who may be thinking of starting their own centers. Like many of our partner sites around the world, Namai was forced to shut down at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. Yasser explains how his staff and the families transitioned to telehealth services and reflects on what he's learned about leadership during this time. We discuss Namai's partnership with the Global Autism Project, his main takeaways from our 2019 Global Summit, and why he admires Skill Corps volunteers. In this episode, discover what's possible when every child is given a voice. For more information about Yasser and Namai Center, please visit our show notes at autismknowsnoborders.com. And now, I present you, Yasser al Jaidi. Hi, Yasser. Welcome to Autism Knows No Borders. Thank you for being here today. Thank you so much for having me, Rachel. Could you please briefly introduce yourself? Okay. My name is Yasser al I am the co-founder and clinical director for Namahi Center in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Let's start with an understanding of how autism is viewed in Saudi Arabia. Okay. I think that autism is kind of new disorder that we started hearing about it like for the last 10 or 15 years ago. So... It's kind of new disorder, but I honestly can say that there is a very good amount of awareness and acceptance of autism in Saudi Arabia. I know in some parts of the world it could be like bad spirits or something like that. But in Saudi Arabia, the common understanding of autism is a neurological disorder. There is no stigma about it. You could face some difficulties if you have a child with autism, but there is some kind of good resources. We hope that these resources will be, or resources will be much more than this, but maybe in the, future, in the near future, we will start seeing that. Mm -hmm. So what kind of services are available for families from the point of diagnosis until adulthood? So from the beginning, when the family starts feeling or noticing that there is something different about their child, they will start seeking diagnosis. I think the process of diagnosis is, I can say fairly that it's accessible for most of the families. If the family lives in like a small city or something like that, they could face some difficulties finding a pediatrician who has enough experience to diagnose autism. But in general, I think the process of diagnosis is kind of accessible for a lot of families. Mm -hmm. After the diagnosis, I think the struggle will start here for like the majority of the families. It's difficult to find a high good quality services. In general, here in Saudi Arabia, there is daycare centers. It's like schools, so the child will go in the morning, spend five hours daily 
it's like school almost, but it's for kids with disabilities. Level of disabilities that you cannot include them in the mainstream schools. So it's the basic services. They have special ed teachers. They have speech language pathologists, occupational therapists. But I think due to the increased number of kids for each therapist, the kids are not getting enough hours of therapy. But in general, it's like the basic service for kids with autism for preschool age. That's covered by the government, so the families don't have to pay for that because it's covered by the government. Mm -hmm. Of course, some parents would like to get like an extra services. They will have to go and like after school sessions, you have to pay for that. So this is the place where the families struggle financially because they think that the services their child getting in the daycare centers are not enough. They're looking for more therapy or more sessions. So they have to pay for these sessions because it's like private practices and they have to pay. And the prices are like vary a lot, but in general, it could be a financial challenge for the majority of families. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what kinds of services are available for adults? So this is a new field in Saudi Arabia. If your child is turning into 13, 14, 15 years old, you'll start facing more difficulties finding proper services for him. Because like most of the centers are providing services for kids in early age, and like from 2, 3 years old until 10, 11 years old. After that, you will face difficulties. There is, I would say, I have to say there is some amazing initiatives here, some amazing organizations that provide training for adults with autism, but still not enough, still not scalable enough. Hmm. Are you hearing of employers hiring adults with autism? Yeah, this one of organization. Our organizations, I think it's called in Arabic, Sari. It's like paving the way for finding jobs for adults with autism. They provide training. I think it's on job training. So they start do the training and then finish the training at job sites. And they are doing very well now. Yeah, and I hope that would be scalable in every area in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. That's really good to hear. Yeah. So Yasser, how did you begin working with the autistic population? That was in 2007. I was fresh graduate. I went to special ed academy here in Saudi Arabia. I was supposed to deliver a gift for the director of this academy from one of my professors in the college. So he offered me a job. He told me, are you interested in working with us? I said, you know, I just graduated seven days ago, so I'm not sure if I want to start immediately. He said, okay, if you want, just give us a call. A few days later, I thought I am interested, so I called them and I start working with them. I work as a psychologist, so I was supposed to treat kids with severe behaviors like self-injurious behavior or aggression. I would say, honestly, I was not prepared at all. So it was very difficult times for me. I remember that for the first few weeks, by the end of the day, I was very exhausted, very overwhelmed. Sometimes I, I cried after the work. Mm. And I swear to God, I will resign from my work first thing tomorrow morning. But I kept going. What made you keep going? I think several things. One of them that I felt some kind of connection with these kids. I was supposed to work with kids who are difficult to handle. So when you work with a child that 
other people feel it's very difficult to work with him, you will have like a unique perspective dealing with him. So other people think he's very difficult. He's very exhausting to work with. I think it's, it's not something you want any child to be seen as that. Mm-hmm. So I felt that maybe I can do something for these kids so they are not considered very difficult kids anymore. I was not prepared. This is something I have to say, but I tried with the resources I have. I'm not happy about these, those days from my qualification side. I was very happy to work with those kids. Whatever progress we did, I'm very grateful for them. But I'm not, I wasn't happy about that time because I think that I didn't have enough qualifications or enough resources or enough training or enough supervision to do what really these kids need and deserve. So that was the beginning. Mm -hmm. After like a year and a half, I decided that I cannot do that anymore. I don't have resources and no one like to have supervision. So I quit and I I joined a private psychiatric clinic. And I wanted to work. I, I love working with kids, but after this experience, I thought I don't have qualifications. So it could be working with adults easier. But based on my experience, I was getting a lot of referrals for kids. A few of them were autistic. So here we are again. Again, I'm working with these kids, this time not in school sitting, this time in clinic sitting which is different from several areas. It's more difficult from some areas. I was not happy because I thought I don't have what these kids need. Actually, some parents were very happy. They said, we have witnessed a lot of progression. We want to continue. I was telling them, we can make much more progress than that if I have enough training or qualifications or resources. But... They were saying, that's okay, we are happy with this level, just please, let's keep working. Then I decided that I need to do something about that. And that was the beginning of looking for ABA field or ABA practices and what later led me to found an MI center. Hmm. And you were the first registered behavior technician, the first RBT in all of Saudi Arabia. Yeah. I was very lucky to have Dr. Susan Einsliger. She's from US and she was working in Jidda Institute for Speech and Hearing. It's a very pioneering center. It's a very great center in Jidda, not in Riyadh. So when I started looking for people who have enough experience in ABA, I only found Dr. Susan Einsliga in Saudi Arabia and Jeddah. So I contacted her for like a lot of contact. I did a lot of contact for her. She was very generous, tried to help me as possible as she can. Then after a lot of pressure, she invited me to do some observation in Jeddah Institute for Speech and Hearing. They were very generous. They were very welcoming. I went and I observed for like a full day. I was very fascinating. I loved what I saw. And that's when I decided that I will get some training in ABA. So yeah, with Dickton Susan Einsliga, she started the, as far as I know, she started the first RBT training in Saudi Arabia. I was in that group. She was very kind to remember me and invite me for the training. I attend the training, I, when I finish the training and the competency assessment I applied for the RBT certification, and yes, I was the first RBT in Saudi Arabia. I don't think it's something I should be proud of, but <laughs> it's, it's something that I love to remember because a very lovely people involved in that. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it is something to be proud of, Yasser, because now with this knowledge, you're able to train other people. 
So you're a pioneer in the field in Saudi. Okay. Maybe you can say that. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. How many RBTs are there now? I didn't check like soon, but I think we are now more than 20, 20 or 30 RBTs okay. in Saudi yeah. Arabia. It's growing. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, absolutely. Tell us about your journey starting Namayi Center. Okay. So when I was in the clinic, I started seeing the number of autistic kids I was seeing start increasing. So the clinic setting was not my optimum setting. I didn't have the freedom or flexibility to create the setting that I think it what these kids need or need and deserve. So I decided that I will create something that would be flexible enough to modify and adjust based on these kids' needs. So we started a small space, called, and we called it Namai, which is in Arabic mean developmental. It went through different phases. And like, I'm very happy and proud and grateful for all these phases. We witnessed a lot of difficulties, but we are now a much more better place. At the beginning, I started working with one kid and home-based therapy for like three months. Then we moved. We came to a school and told them, okay, uh, it's actually kindergarten. We told them, you guys finish at like 12 from PM. So the rest of the day is waste. How about if we work in your kindergarten from, let's say, 1.30 p.m. until 7.30 p.m. And we'll pay you rent. So And all of the materials are there. Yeah. The classrooms are set up for you. Yeah. Yeah. Only a few things that I will have to bring so that the, the, the kindergartens with a good financial resources, they didn't want to work with us because they thought it doesn't worth it. So I went for kindergarten that I think they will use the money. And they said, okay, you can use the school. We started there. We start working after the kindergarten finish. As you said, we don't have to prepare the school classrooms, everything is there, almost everything. We just have to bring a few things that our kids will, will need. So, yeah, we spent a few, I think, three years in that setting, moving from one kindergarten to another kindergarten until we ended up here in this, like, it's now a clinic. It's official clinic now we are working in. Mm -hmm. And how many students do you have now? Between 25 to 30 kids, we are after school setting, so kids will come to us for like sessions. A session will take two hours. A child will, in general, will come to us like twice weekly. So we have like 30 kids coming to us weekly. We started a few years ago with one kid, now we have 30 kids. So mm -hmm. It's slow progression, but... It is the progression. Right, yeah. How many staff members do you have? Five therapists or therapists. And like the total, we are like nine people in the center now. Mm -hmm. Including admin. and Yeah. So what were some of those challenges or barriers that you had to overcome along the way? A lot. I will start with the clinical challenge. At the beginning and still now, I didn't have the, the resources, the clinical resources, the training, the supervision. I had to, to fight to be in touch with someone in the U.S. to supervise me. I was not doing my RBT. I started doing my PCABA at that time. So I found someone to supervise me. At that time, it was very difficult for the supervisor who was not fully aware of my situation to help me address my challenges and my kids' challenges like, very effectively. It helped, but it was not enough for me. I always wanted more. Finding people and training them was some kind of a challenge. I might be a 
a perfectionist, so it makes it kind of makes working with me difficult. Do you think you're too demanding? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, yeah. You want to do something that you think is good enough for the kid. So defining good enough for the kid is different from a person to another. My good enough criteria is kind of high, which makes it difficult for me and people who work with me to work with that kid because we, I always wanted more for the kids. So that means I will keep demanding going up. Mm -hmm. There was the financial challenge, the, the money. It was difficult. When we started this, we didn't have money, actually. I remember, like, borrowing money from a friend to pay for the kindergarten. The kindergarten wants us to pay, like, for six months in advance. Like, this is the minimum. But I told them I cannot pay more than one month. So, yeah, the, we didn't have money at all. And when you started something like that, you have to spend, I would say, lots of money. We didn't have, like, any money at all. All we have, our own money, we used it wisely because we didn't have a lot. So, yeah, the money was continuous challenge. It's still until now, but it, we are, like, in much more controlling position now regarding money. We still have difficulties, but we're in a much more better place now. Mm -hmm. Whereas also... I would say that the, the license process for clinics and all these bureaucratic procedures, but once we overcome that, we don't have to worry about them anymore. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so you started a program called Give Me a Voice. Tell us about that. Okay. So when, when I realized that there is a lack of resources for families to help their kids. I wanted something that I can offer for nonprofit organizations, for social responsibilities, for corporates. I tried several things with these organizations. I think it's like very normal, but they didn't prefer to pay for something forever. They prefer something specific. With clear cut limits, they will start from here, will end here. We will do one, two, three. The beneficiaries would be one, two, three. So, also with my work, we start realizing and seeing the results of the verbal behavior approach, how the child life and the family life will change when the child starts expressing his needs. So man training and enabling the child to express his need as a human being was very important for me. So the result of all these things that we decide to create a specific program that will target the ability to talk or to express the needs of the child. And we made it like three months in total 72 hours. And I start going to these organizations and big corporates. We were very lucky to meet a very wonderful guy. His name is Dr. Fahad Al Aliyan. He is a like the social responsibility officer in a bank here in Saudi Arabia called Bank Al Jazeera. And he believed in this program and he supported us with, for ten kids. And that's where we started Give Me a Voice. With the first 10 kids program finish, Dr. Fahad met with the mothers of these kids and he was very amazed by the reaction of the mothers or the families of these kids, how the lives of the kids and their parents were changed because of the child now can speak can express his needs. He's no longer in need to cry, to hit himself, to throw himself on the ground, because now he has a very reliable tool to communicate his needs, his thoughts, his emotions. 
And that was a life changer for these kids and their families. So the next step that Dr. Fahad took was to decided to continue to help us with these kids. We started increase the number of sponsors of the program. Now we have a contract with a nonprofit organization to train a hundred child on the Give Me a Voice program. So wow. what starts with a small idea, it's now a huge opportunity for like we could reach hundreds of kids in the new near future. So that could be a very good idea for other practitioners around the world. If you want the nonprofit organizations or big corporates to sponsor these kinds of programs, from my experience, based on my experience in Saudi Arabia, offer them something specific, something limited. Not limited means a little, it means limited with clear start, clear end. This amount of hours for this um, specific goals, that would make them more accepting. That would persuade them to sponsor these kind of programs. Yeah, that makes sense. That's great advice, actually, because they would then be able to see the results, maybe even quicker yeah. with short-term goals. Yes. And that's such an important program, Yasser, because like you said, it is getting their needs met but it's also affecting the whole family dynamic. Yes. You know, the parents sometimes feel so helpless when they don't know what their child needs. Absolutely. And that frustration on their side too. And, you know, with giving them a voice, they're able to then communicate and it just grows because we know that when you start with man training, which is training to request for things or things that you don't want, then it just opens the doors to more communication, to adding words to those sentences, to then maybe asking questions and engaging in back and forth communication. Absolutely. That's what we saw and witnessed with all our kids now in, in Namai. I will tell the parents, you are the boss of your child therapy program or plan. The only one thing that I won't be able to negotiate, negotiate about is the child being able to communicate his basic needs. This is something I cannot negotiate about. Mm. It's an ethical issue to start working on anything before man training. I would start with man training and with other areas. That's okay. Mm -hmm. But the most important thing for me in Namai, this is our experience, this is our vision, to make the child able to communicate his basic needs. Because what I think is the most important ability that makes us different or unique compared to other creatures is that we can communicate in a sophisticated language. Each kind, each species has its has its own language, but our language is more sophisticated. So when my kids cannot communicate their needs, I think this is something very urgent for me to address. So that's the basic of Give Me Voice work. Mm -hmm. And do you offer programs for kids who are nonverbal? Yes. It's for all kids. Could you elaborate on that and explain what that would look like? Okay. So the idea of the verbal behavior, it's not the vocal behavior. There is a difference between verbal behavior and, or the language and the vocal behavior. The vocal or the producing sounds is one kind or one form of the language. You can use the sign language. You can use the written language. You can use some language replacements or alternatives like PEX. I know it's not like the perfect language, but it's a very effective tool to communicate. Can you explain PEX for our listeners who are not familiar with it? Okay. So PEX is Pictures Exchange Communication System. 
it's a way of communication where the child can give you a picture of water, which means I want water. The child will give you a picture of a chips, potato chips, and that means I want to eat potato chips. The idea of Give Me a Voice is to enable the child to express his needs in whatsoever language. So you can use the vocal language. If the child is not vocal or he cannot produce sounds, that's okay. We can use the sign language. If he cannot use the sign language for any reason, that's okay. We can use PECS or other AAC, uh, Augmentative Alternative Communication System or something like that. So we can use that. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you for explaining that. You're welcome. Could you share a success story related to one of your students? Yeah, this is a story about a little girl, a very wonderful little girl and a very wonderful family. So this child came to us a few years ago. She was five. We were at the first year of Namai. She was not verbal. She can like repeat phrases she hear from the TV or from her parents but she's not using the language as a function at all. She will be very thirsty, but she won't tell her mother that she's thirsty and she wants water. She will be very hungry, but she will cry until her mother starts kissing what she wants. Was she in pain? So based on that, she and her family faced a lot of troubles to make her join a kindergarten. She would go for the first day. By the end of the day, the kindergarten would say to the parents, we're sorry, we cannot handle your child. So when I first met her, I told the parent that we would start with some sessions here. Then we can discuss the joining the school a little bit later. We started with the child. With the man training, she was very fast learner. In a few weeks or a few days, she starts commanding verbally in a sentence of three words. She has the full ability to speak, but she was not using it as a function. She starts like burning her goals in the plan. Whatever plan we have, whatever goals we have in the plan, she will finish them very soon. And three months, we decided with the parents that we will make her join the new school year. So I contact the principal of the kindergarten we are using right now, or that time. So I told her, I have a child. She's five years old. She's very smart. And she has autism. And I want her to start working with you. We are ready to send a therapist with her. And in case you thought that, oh, we cannot handle her. So we will send a therapist to make her, like, succeed in the first few days. They said, there is no need. Just let her start. So it's the first day in the school year. So by the end of the day, the the principal of the school called me, and she said, we're sorry, we cannot have the child anymore. I said, why? She said, she spent the day crying, the whole day. So I told her, this is the first day in the school year. And this is kindergarten. Is it not usual to see kids crying the whole day? Mm -hmm. Or just because I told you my girl has autism? She said, you are sorry. We just cannot have her anymore. I said, that's okay. I remember I told her this. I told her my child would be in a much more better position that you thought she cannot be in. If you think she cannot belong to the classroom with the other kids, I think she will be in a better place because I knew that this child has a lot of potentials. So we stopped going to that school. The parents were kind of devastated. They thought that maybe our child is not meant to be in school. They were very brave and fighters, the the parents of this child. But it's very difficult for them to to feel that their child is excluded from the school. Mm -hmm. 
So we continue the sessions and we started with another school. They have like a, we, we call it here, inclusion classrooms. Mm-hmm. So they will have like classroom or classrooms for typically developed kids. And they will have one or two or more classrooms for kids with special needs. So she started the first year in school. The year was very good. The teacher loved her. She was the top of her class. We were very happy because of that. It's still including classroom. The kids with her like were below her level in performance. But that was okay for us. This is a very huge step. So the, the first school year finish. At the beginning of the second school year, I called the... Um, like the principal of the school, and I told her, maybe we are ready to move to a regular classroom. We will like be in, in a trial, experiment, see if you decide if she's okay to continue in the regular classroom, then that's what we want. If not, we are ready to go back to the including classroom. She said, no. Yeah, she's the best child in her class, but no. Mm. I told her we will send a therapist with her if that's needed. She said, no, we cannot. Just she's only in the we register her in our school only in the inclusion classroom. So we have a discussion with the parents and we decided that that's okay. We will finish this school year. It's like the second grade. We will finish the second grade in this school. The school the, the, that year was Very wonderful. The child was in the top of her class. She was mastering all the topics. She's studying math, science, language, all of them. So before the start of the third grade, we had this discussion with the parents and I told them, I think you are ready to go to another school and to go for the typical classroom. We don't need including classroom. They were very hesitant. They thought this is a school that accepts our child. She's doing very good. We could risk the future of our child. So we think it's much more safe to stay in this school. But I thought that that this child definitely will survive and succeed in a regular classroom. So I encourage them with few like conditions and terms, we agreed that we will work closely together. We register, we moved her to this school, different school. We told her, yes, she maybe has autism, but you won't be able to like recognize that. This is not something we are ashamed of or ashamed of, but we want to be clear. Our child has autism, but she definitely can do a regular classroom. So this school was... Like, uh, more accepting, they said, okay, we'll try. If she went with the classroom, we will keep her in that. And, yeah, she finished third grade. She is on top of her class. All her classmates are typically developed kids. And she's number one in the class. Wow. Like, seriously. Not they are, like, giving her away any marks or no. She is on top of her class. Mm-hmm. She won or won the spelling bee competition for East of Riyadh, like dozens of schools, and she won won the spelling bees, and she will run for the whole Riyadh area spelling bee competition. Wow! She is like the top child in the classroom. That's such a beautiful and inspiring story, and also just. I hope is a reminder to people to not underestimate anyone's potential and to not limit them. I would have wanted to go back to that first principal and show her and say, hey, look, you wouldn't even give us a chance the first day of kindergarten. And now look where this girl is. Yeah, I actually honestly thought about that several times, but I didn't do it because I thought I was very... Like, I would take it very personally because I felt that 
this little child lost the opportunity, which I was sure that she will succeed in that opportunity, but we were not patient for her for only one day. Then we decided, no, we cannot take her any time anymore. Just take her from here. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I honestly don't want to blame that principal. Maybe she doesn't have the required resources. Maybe she doesn't have like support from whatever authority would help her. But the fact is, our child now in fourth grade this year, will school year will start in like a few weeks, she will be in fifth grade and she's in top of her class. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a beautiful story, Yasser. Thank you. So looking back on your journey of starting Namayi six years ago, how would you say your leadership style has evolved over the years? I love the idea that you're using evolve because <laughs> at the beginning, I think I have a very terrible leadership style, probably still. But at the beginning, I was not actual leader. I was working by myself, with myself, with one child. So I was depending on myself and doing everything. So I am the the therapist. When I start hiring, or when we start hiring other therapists, I start feeling not comfortable with that because please do the job the way I told you because this child is my responsibility. So I need to make sure that he will be treated as if I am the one who worked with him. Then I realized that I won't be able to do that with all kids we are start having now. So I start like delegating more tasks to the therapists with very close supervision because I wanted to make sure that everything is or was done in the right way. It's that perfectionist in you. Yeah, that's very difficult sometimes. So it was a very difficult period of time because it is not easy for everyone to delegate. You will feel that things are going out of control. You're not sure how the session was conducted. So maybe it's not a good idea to have other therapists working with me, but keep working by myself that will limit the impact that we can create in in, in this kid's life. So I was like moving, slowly evolving as you use it evolving to delegate more, then with the team getting more experience. Now there is some therapist who has more experience than others, so they start becoming lead therapists. Then I have to move a little bit back and start supervising the whole process. Because if I kept doing The tiny things, I won't be able to see the whole picture Mm -hmm. or the big picture, which means I will, or the center or the organization would lose a lot of things. We did that actually for like maybe a long time, but we evolved through that I have to go back a little bit, keep watching the big picture, making sure that the daily work or processes or procedures are going smoothly. So maybe I'm in the first stage of leadership evolving. Maybe I still need a few stages, but I think that I am still some kind of trouble leader. So I'm very sorry for all therapists who work with me. I'm very sorry. Maybe you will like find peace someday. Hold on, Yasser. Wait, wait, stop right there. Because I'd like to add that I have seen you in action as a supervisor, providing training and giving feedback to your therapist, to your staff. And you have actually, I think, the perfect balance of being direct and also gentle. And 
I've seen them and how they interact with you. They respect you because you're real with them. And also you always add this twist of humor. So even when it's really important to you, you're able to kind of package it in a way that is easy for them to accept it and then start applying it. And I also love that you incorporate the Socratic approach to your supervision because it fosters that critical thinking in your staff and you're shaping them to be excellent therapists to make decisions on their own. So I just wanted to say that because I know you will not say that about yourself and I want people to know how strong of a leader you actually are. Thank you. Maybe you should ask my therapists, (laughs) but maybe later. I think they will agree with me. I hope so. (laughs) So Yasser, how has the COVID-19 pandemic affected your center? Did you have to shut down at some point? Yeah, we had to shut down for like almost three months. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning of the pandemic, we were worried because we, as the whole world, didn't know what will happen next. It was rapidly evolving. So with the evolving situation, we thought that maybe we can go for a few weeks to see how's that going to be. Then we, with the daily, weekly, sometimes daily reassessment, we decided that we should stop now until we see how things will go. And the day we decided that we will stop, the, the next day immediately the government decided to close all the schools and clinics and probably the whole economy at the beginning. They make it like a partial curfew. The businesses are supposed to stop. Only the vital businesses are supposed to continue. So yeah, we was forced to shut down for like three months. We decided at the beginning, when we decided we will shut down, we decided to ask our families and our parents if they want us to continue supporting them through a line. And that was like a new experience for us. We asked them, like the majority of them, they said, yes, we would like that you continue supporting us through a line. So it was like weekly sessions with each family. It was free of charge. Because we were not we were not doing like a full services. It was it was like supportive uh, sessions, and I can say that some of the kids, the kids and the families were very okay with the shutdown at the beginning. Because depending on the family, some of the families can maintain or could maintain the amount of therapy that their, their child used to have. But some of them, they couldn't do it. It was very difficult for them. We kept supporting them through online sessions. In general, we kept the online sessions for a month or two. Then we have our annual month off. We continue the online services for like a few weeks. Then the government decided they now can open the economy again. We are allowed to work again. Okay. So we are now back to uh, like on-site sessions. Mm -hmm. That's good. So what's the current situation in Saudi Arabia as far as COVID cases? It's very good. Honestly, the government could control the pandemic in a very good way. After the curfew, the government decided to open the economy gradually. Now it's like fully open. We keep the uh, precaution procedures. We work or function like we have all our sessions on. We use all the procedures that help us to make sure that our kids are safe. Mm-hmm. Great. So during our partner call last week with all the partners, Molly, our CEO, asked a question that I really like, so I'm going to repeat it now. Okay. Fill in the blank. If it weren't for COVID, I wouldn't have blank. And again, this is not discounting the deaths and suffering that is going on, but think about it like what are you grateful for because of COVID? The time we we spent in the curfew, 
It was a very important time for me because it was the first time that I stopped working in Namai for the last six years. So I was home thinking of Namai. There is no sessions now. There is no kids coming now. So I start reflecting on Namai. And I'm very grateful for that pose because I realized that I never thought of Namahi as a business, as something need to be sustainable, need to be maintained. I always thought of Namahi as something I enjoy doing, something that I feel passionate about. It's something that I want to keep doing forever, but that's not enough to sustain an organization because these kinds of organizations shouldn't be depending on one person. It shouldn't be a one-man show. The lives and the good services shouldn't be rely on one or two or three persons. We should make or create an organization that can continue working, survive, sustain, no, no matter or it's, it's not important who's working in Namai. It's important that Namai is fully functioning, no matter who's working in Namai. And that was not something like easy for me because I never thought of Namai as a business. I honestly don't want to think of Namai as a business. Maybe because I think that these kids should be served free of charge. Mm. These kids do deserve to have the full services they need without considering their financial ability. Mm -hmm. But it is what it is. This is the fact. Namai is a private practice and eventually it's a business that needs to be maintained and sustained. So this is the must thing that I'm grateful for this Both time. I start seeing Namai now as a business, a business that's not concerned about money only. It's a business that's concerned about the kids also. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's what I'm grateful for the pandemic, if we can say that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that mentality will help you make decisions in the future to have that growth mindset, and I mean growth mindset as far as growing the center. And like you were saying before, having more of a reach, impacting more families. Yeah. All right, Yasser. So tell us about your partnership with the Global Autism Project. This is the, the best thing that's happened to me in, <laughs> since I started working in my so as I told you at the beginning, I felt that, that I'm not supported, that I'm working by myself. We as a team didn't have enough support, enough training, enough supervision. So when I started reaching out for people to help me, the majority of them, or maybe all of them, were very kind, very generous. They helped me, but it was not enough to deliver a high quality services. So I kept looking, but when I came across Global Autism Project, I told myself, this is my perfect solution for all of the majority of challenges that I'm facing now, because I'm in love with the model that Global Autism Project is using. It's a very sensitive, very considerate. They will work with you from where you are. You doesn't have you don't have to be in this level of quality or services. They will work with you wherever you are. They will help you grow and evolve. I start reaching out for robots and projects. In 2016, for different circumstances that took a little bit longer, in 2018, in August, and almost these days in 2018, 
I met Cassie, the Outreach Director and Global Citizen Project. Mm-hmm. My dear friend Cassie. <laughs> she came with Shmaila Jeffrey to assist Nama'i and see if we can like have the partnership. And from that day, Nama'i was different forever. Since that day, we started to have a very solid, sensitive supervision that will address the challenges we have based on our culture, our challenge, our experiences. So I honestly think that if it wasn't for Global Citizen Project to be partner with us, I don't think that we will continue working because they changed the, the way we work. They change the way we help our kids. They change the way we look to our work. So I'm a very big fan of Global Autism Project and the whole team. Thank you, Yasser. You're welcome. So you attended Global Summit last August in Bali. What was it like for you to spend that week with all of the partners? It's a life-changing experience. Like, literally, it's a life-changing experience. It's not common to meet with different people from all over the world. People who are like you, who are in almost the same position or same place where you are. People from all over the world. They have centers. They struggle with the money. They struggle with the clinical work. They struggle with the resources. You'll feel that you're not alone. You'll feel that this is some kind of same path with few differences. You learn from them. You recognize the challenge you have and their challenge. So I probably won't be able to describe how I felt when I met these people. And the content of the Global Summit was amazingly prepared. I would say that I've never attended any kind of gathering, any kind, that I got all these enlightening ideas. They were not lecturing us about how to do this, what to do with this problem, how to address this No. It was about the way you think, the way you see your work, the way you see the challenge, the way you see other people in this equation. So I was only upset because I couldn't attend all the workshops and uh, (laughs) the seminars because I couldn't be in all the places at the same time. But it was something that I will remember for the rest of my life. What was your biggest takeaway from that experience? Several takeaways. The way I think about myself working in Namai, that was one of the biggest things that I became see it in a different way. I used to look at myself or look at Namai as something that I love to do and I will keep doing at the same way. But with the Global Summit, I realized that a lot of challenges or struggles or working on the mind, it's actually my own personal challenges and struggles. It's some kind of reflection of my own personal struggles. So when you realize that, you realize that maybe if you overcome your own personal struggles, this struggle in the Ma'i will be able to overcome it. Maybe if you use someone, hire someone who hopefully doesn't have the same personal struggle you have, will be able to overcome that struggle. So the mindset that I got from Global Autism Project, it's something priceless. Well, I'm glad that you were able to learn so much about yourself. And also, you've had a couple Skill Corps volunteer teams visit Namayi last year. Yeah. And unfortunately, we were getting on a good roll, but this year had to cancel all the trips. What has your experience with Skill Corps been like? I was in love with them. Like, 
whole teams. They are very brave, passionate group of people. They are brave and some kind crazy enough to travel across the world just to help someone, helping some kids that they don't know me and they don't know the kids I'm working with, but they very considerate and concerned to travel and help me. They, they fundraise to do that. I was looking forward to meet them. I had two school core teams. Both of them were very wonderful teams. I'm very lucky. I wish that all the teams will be like the both teams that I had. <laughs> I don't think there is a team that could be better than my two teams, but you know, when you have these energetic, passionate people, they came to you in a very different culture, a very different country. They have some old information about Saudi Arabia, the Saudi community, how people in Saudi Arabia. So it was like a unique experience for both of us, for me and for them. Mm -hmm. They spend a lot of time working with us in the center. They divide themselves into groups. Group will work with this and this therapist on this kind of problems. Another group will work with another group of my therapists to teach them different topics and areas. Some of them will work with me for the areas that I'm supposed to oversee, like the plan, the vision for Namahi. All of them were like very lovely and kind and brave people. As I told my, my therapist, these teams touched our souls. <laughs> each child, each and every child we are working with now and will work with in the future, these teams has impacted us and impacted the way we work with these kids. So every single child we are working with is touched by these teams. And what part of Saudi culture do you like to share with the teams when they visit? I would say every single aspect of the Saudi that we can <laughs> cover because this is a very different culture. Maybe they have like misunderstanding of the Saudi culture from the media. When they come here, they would ask about how the society is, uh, how women in this society is doing. They were like surprised to see Saudi women living their lives, doing their jobs, going and coming. We try to expose them to absolutely the food, of course. We had to take them to some remote areas in the middle of the desert. We like let them meet some Saudi uh, females to see how the life is from the, the eyes of the Saudi member or the Saudi the Saudis here. We also, I remember, we met with some expats in Saudi Arabia to help my team or my skill call team to see how these expats live and work in Saudi Arabia for so many years. Mm -hmm. Actually, one of the teams had the opportunity to attend a wedding, a Saudi wedding, and it was a very good experience. I wanted to do that with the second team, but we were not able to <laughs> secure a wedding. Yeah. I think we crush a wedding. <laughs> That's a really special moment for the skill core too, experience. Yeah. You know, speaking from my own experience, I visited Saudi Arabia twice last year and it absolutely blew my mind. You know, I've traveled plenty of times in my life and after a while there came a point when I stopped getting that culture shock. But when I visited Riyadh for the first time last May, I felt a culture shock that I've never experienced before. And it actually started when the plane was landing. I was looking out the window and I saw just sand. Yeah. And I thought to myself, I'm so far away from home right now. 
<laughs> You're right. Another big thing for me was the traditional attire. I had seen women wearing full burqas before, but just not so many all at once. And it was like a sea of black and white, you know, black with the burqas and white with the thob. Is that how you pronounce it? Thobes, yeah. Yeah. And the ladies at the center, Sarah and Marwa, they were so sweet. And they let me ask all of my ignorant American questions about Saudi culture and <laughs> Islam beliefs. And also it was Ramadan at that time. Do you remember? So yeah, yeah. I was pretty much fasting with you guys. We would start the day late because it was impossible to be outside during the day in that heat. And sessions at the center were run from 8 p.m. until midnight. Yeah. And then we would have our trainings and meetings until 3 or 4 in the morning, go to bed at 6 o'clock in the morning, wake up at 2 in the afternoon. <laughs> yeah. And the first meal was like 6 p.m. It was like I had traveled across the world into a new time zone when really Barcelona and Riyadh are just an hour difference. Yeah. It was like Ramadan time zone. And you know, that trip really made me question a lot of my own beliefs that I held to be true. And you and I, Yasser, we had a lot of great conversations about absolute right or wrong or the lack of absolute right or wrong. Yeah. And just comparing our different cultures. And it was very, very humbling for me. So thank you again for that unforgettable experience. Actually, thank you. Yes, sir. I'd like to close with one last question. Do you have any advice for other business owners who might be thinking of starting an ABA business of their own? I think the most important advice is before you decide to start an ABA business, just make sure that you are absolutely love what you're doing. Because if this is something about only making a living or about money, I think you will find different businesses or jobs that would make good money without all the challenge and emotional overwhelming that you can get from working with different populations that you will be working with. Because I'm not saying that ABA businesses is not making good money. They could. But it's it's very it's very demanding. It's some kind of consuming your inner energy your emotion, if you don't have the passion and love for what you do and the people you are serving, then you should consider a different career or a different business. Mm -hmm. Because I think only the passion and the love for the kids and what you're doing, only this will fuel you to continue working in this kind of businesses. Because... Believe me, if it's about money, just find another area. Well, Yasser, it's always a pleasure speaking with you. I miss our weekly calls and also seeing you and the team at Namayi in person. So I hope we can all get together again someday soon. But for now, we have our monthly partner calls, which allows us to catch up with everyone and keep our community intact. Yeah. So it's always fun to see people on the screen from all different corners of the world. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Yasser. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's always my pleasure to speak to you, Rachel. Thanks for tuning in to Autism Knows No Borders. The story that Yasser shared about his student being refused attendance at school because of her autism reminded me once again that we must never underestimate anyone's potential. Unfortunately, this is far from the first time I've heard such stories. I used to work with a boy in France who was kicked out of school because they couldn't find an aide that was willing to work with him. In many countries, students with autism are effectively excluded from the education system, as schools often lack adequate resources to accommodate their needs. The work that Yasser and our partners are doing around the world is fundamental to overcoming these challenges. 
As autism becomes increasingly understood in their areas, communities can develop ways to support and empower families. More proper training for professionals will afford more opportunities for children with autism to thrive. By presuming competence, we can avoid setting unnecessary limits and instead build on each child's strengths. Just a reminder that we're still taking donations for our COVID-19 Partner Relief Fund. Our partners across the globe share our vision of creating a world where every person with autism can reach their potential, no matter where they live. As a result of COVID-19, most of these schools and autism centers have shifted their work to support their students remotely, with many of them volunteering their time. 100% of your donations to the Partner Relief Fund will go directly to our partners who need it most, like Yasser from Namai. You will be supporting internet access for remote teaching, educational materials, and protective equipment. You can make a difference today by joining us to create better opportunities for these children at risk. Donations can be made at globalautismproject.org. Thanks for listening. Take care. You've been watching Autism Knows No Borders. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Also, we'd love to hear from you, so let us know what you think in the comment section. Click here to watch another interview from our podcast. You can also find us on your favorite podcast app. Tune in each week for engaging conversations of how people across the globe are inspiring change and building community. Thanks for watching. Take care.